Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Sunday devotional as we celebrate together the second Sunday of Easter. I just want to uh, take a moment to thank you for tuning in for our Holy Week and uh, Resurrection Sunday services. Hopefully that you were able to find them okay, and hopefully they were meaningful to you. I know this is now almost, I think, a month uh, to the Sunday that we are uh, in this new format together. And while it's different and continues to be different, hopefully we're all hitting our stride a bit as we are worshiping together in this new format. Uh, Today is famously known as Low Sunday. Well, this is the lowest Sunday that I've ever seen. Uh, Usually we laugh among clergy about it being Low Sunday because, well, very few people show up. And as I look around the room, there is absolutely nobody here. So I think this is a record setting low Sunday. Uh, Hopefully our online turnout will be a little bit higher uh, than it is here today. But we begin our worship. Hopefully you've been finding our uh, online uh, versions and copies of our bulletin. You can follow along with me as we go together and we worship for this Sunday. So we begin with our call to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another in this moment together. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us of all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. If you would please join with the prayer of the day as it's printed for you in your bulletin. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today's psalm is Psalm 16. If from home you could, please read responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is in the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble against the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods, never take their names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life, In your presence there is fullness of joy. 
and your, in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Here ends our psalm. Amen. Our gospel lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they forgive them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were still shut, that Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Here ends our gospel lesson. Well, good morning again, you beautiful people. Today we find ourselves confronted by this traditional story for the second Sunday of Easter, that of the infamous Doubting Thomas. I don't think since I've become a pastor here at Emmanuel have I ever preached on his doubt. Why? Well, it's so human. All of them, as we hear, were afraid, and this is made from the very get-go of today's gospel narrative. When the good news of Jesus' resurrection was announced to them, as we heard in the gospel last week, a foot race happened between Peter and John, but nothing but an empty tomb was seen by them. But then Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene and asks her, Why are you weeping? After the revelation of who he is, she in turn brings this good news to the disciples, who we can only imagine all experience a little bit of skepticism. Why? Because they remained locked in their home and fearful of the authorities. Good news, as we hear, cannot always banish fear and sadness. We know that's true, especially in this COVID world. So of course, they were elated when Jesus appeared. Finally, they saw him with their own eyes, and they rejoiced. But Thomas wasn't there. He was out doing, we assume, things on behalf of the others while they were inside paralyzed by their fear. When they told him the good news, he wasn't satisfied with their good news either. He desired to see his beloved teacher, to touch him, to be with him. And while John's narrative paints Thomas in such a negative way, I'm hesitant to believe that Jesus would ever truly con have condemned him so. Sure, Jesus might have reminded him that faith isn't always about what you can see and what you can touch, but I don't think that he would have ever suggested that Thomas was less blessed for his desire to be with and love his beloved teacher. That isn't the Jesus we know. 
My friends, today I want to talk about how we, like Thomas, desire to be with one another and see one another, especially in the challenging time of grief. For some time now, my wife Ashley and I, who many of you know is a hospice chaplain, have been talking about and worrying about how people in this current pandemic climate are so hobbled in their ability to grieve. The reality is during the months ahead, almost all of us will be touched by the sting of loss in some capacity, whether virus related or not. Indeed, even in the time this month since we've begun to worship in this new capacity, six or more people in our community have experienced losses, including spouses, children, parents, family, and friends. And the most normal of experiences of loss, which if we're honest, no loss ever feels normal, we grieve in community and with others. We offer our love physically and in person. We weep with one another and we share stories. We offer our shoulders to cry on and we offer comforting words in the most empathetic way that we can. And this is not something that is new, not something unique to just us here at Emmanuel. For as we hear this morning, the disciples, as we know from the story, sat in fear and sadness after Jesus died. That we know. But I would also speculate that they sat Shiva, the traditional communal Jewish way of mourning. They grieved together because it was what is most natural to them as it is to us. Shared grief is a healthy way to process the sadness and the hurt that comes from loss. So there's something so very unnatural about being apart. As I've said in recent weeks, I so strongly believe that our love and our spirit remains together. But that doesn't make it less difficult to be apart, especially in our times of mourning. And the hard truth is, there is no good solution to this problem. Hospitals, as we know it across the country, are having to make the hard, gut-wrenching decisions right now because of COVID that are keeping families apart for the sake of everyone's safety. Clergy of all stripes are being forced to change and to adapt the ways that they offer their counsel and ministry, and that ministry of presence that we often hold so dear. And all of us, because of our responsibility to the whole, are limiting our travel, even when we so desperately wish to be with the ones that we care for. We desire to be together because that is such a part of our love. We wish to be together to memorialize lives, but that is beyond what we are allowed to do and what is safe. So how can I blame Thomas? And I don't think any of us can be blamed for our desire to be one, one another. These are such challenging times that none of us ever anticipated, leaving us all feeling very much out of control and wanting some peace of heart. The good news of Jesus' resurrection remains good news for us all, but that doesn't completely diminish our grief. And I wish, as your pastor, that I had some solution on how to overcome the challenges of this grieving time. But I don't. Grief, even in the best of circumstances, is hard and it moves at its own speed. And now it moves largely without the help of others. All I can do, all we can do, is to acknowledge one another's grief. So I say to those of you who are struggling, I see your suffering. I see your sadness. I see how heavy it must feel on your heart. 
I recognize daily that you feel alone and lost. But I promise you, even if it feels that way, you aren't. Because just as Jesus is with you always, my heart is always with you. My love is with you, even if I can't offer my shoulder to cry on, even if I can't be there to give you a hug. You are loved and you are cared for, and I will hold you always in my heart. My friends, we must all adapt to how things are changing and be prepared to find new ways to grieve together. So in these weeks, months ahead, I encourage you to continue to do the good work that you're doing as you minister to one another in love, as you call as you write letters and emails. That is the way right now that we express our love. And for that, my friends, I am so thankful for you all, as I know God is as well. I love you all. Amen. And my dear friends, you probably heard some prayer in that sermon. But there are many prayers in our hearts, many prayers for those in this community, many prayers for those beyond its walls and beyond this area. And so with the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Gracious God, on this week after Jesus' resurrection, we remember Thomas, who had a great desire to see his beloved teacher and Lord. We are mindful of a world that in its mourning wishes to be with one another, and we recognize those who grieve silently alone. We know you love us, dear God, and we pray each day for that reminder. We also pray that others might know our love too, so that even as we are physically apart and even as we struggle, we might continue to be together in spirit. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. And so, dear God, as we pray for a world that mourns, we especially remember this day Daryl Sackle, friend of Jan Phillips, as well as her cousin Alex Cool, who passed away this past week. We also mourn the loss of a member of our community, Susie Drum, the beloved wife of John, who passed away on April 11th. Our hearts are with those who mourn as they grieve and we hope that they know our love is with them. And we pray, dear God, that your comfort be known to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are a great healer, dear, dear God. In time, you heal hearts and help us move forward. But we also currently pray for a world that is filled with people who are sick and in need of care. When we especially pray for the health of a world and country as we continue to confront COVID-19 in our lives. We pray that all these protective measures continue to be successful, that we continue to act and live responsibly so that we might live fully together again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. To you, O Comforter, we pray for the bereaved, the marginalized, the stranger, and the oppressed. We pray for those people who continue to serve one another. We pray for those who are in hospitals and care teams who are rushing ahead while we can live in safety behind. We're mindful of all those people who help bring food to our table, especially now. And dear God, we also pray for this nation's leadership, that we might continue to make decisions that are mindful of the well-being of its people. This we say, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Dear friends, there are many prayers in our hearts, some maybe of which I've raised aloud, but in this moment of silence together, God will hear our prayers as we lift them to him. Let us be silent together.
gracious God. This morning we're reminded of Thomas's great need and desire to be with his teacher. And so, dear God, we are also reminded of our own needs to be together in community, both physically as in spirit. And so, dear God, because we know that you are always with us and that you always wish to be with us, that we can commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, my dear friends, while we continue to be apart, our hearts are with one another. Continue to love one another as God loves you. And so may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you each with grace and mercy. May God look upon you all with favor and forever give you his peace. Amen. Be healthy, my friends. Be safe. I will see you soon.